Ready? Ready? Tragedies of time were no match for your love. From great heights of glory, you saw my story. God, you entered in and became one of us. Sing hallelujah. Sing Welcome. I don't know what all you're coming from this morning. I know that there are people that are sick today, probably watching online. I know that there are visitors among us and that we welcome you here. I am surrounded by lots of lights, but they are but a symbol of the light of the world, which we just sang about. And whatever you're coming from, I promise you, it looks different in the light of Jesus. 
I'm reading a book right now at home that talks about the word delight, and the author suggests that the way that the word delight is written um, suggests both the idea of the Latin prefix D as in of light, and also as in like you would use for decaf coffee, without light, delight, could be both of light and without light at the same time. And I got curious about that word and I looked up the Hebrew meaning of the word and the Hebrew meaning was to bend towards or to incline towards as a flower may bend towards the light. Scripture tells us often to delight in the Lord and in, the, in his word, and in his law, um, and in his promises. We have a lot of different stories that are going to be shared this morning about God's people, about the shepherds, and um, this morning I'm going to read about Simeon. And all these people, I would suggest, were filled with delight for the Lord. And I think especially about Simeon as he was a seeker, continually bending towards the light of Jesus. And I will read those verses from Luke 2, 25 through 32, as our call to worship. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. We welcome you to stand if you're able for the next couple songs. Uh, this first one has the music up on the screen and there is a uh, top line and a bottom line when you get to the refrain. So you can choose whichever line you'd like to sing. Hannah will be on the lower line and Greta on the upper line.
seated. If I could have the kids join me for children's story time. Looks like we've already got some kids up here. That's great. All the Coleman boys. We have another gift up here. Let's see what it is this week. We've got Mary and Joseph so far. We already put lots of material in the manger to make baby Jesus feel comfortable, huh? Very ordinary fabrics, right? Okay, we've got a couple figures in here this morning. What does this look like? It's a shepherd. How do you know that? Because it's holding a sheep. A shepherd is somebody who herds sheep. That's the name shepherd. Very good. So there's the shepherd with the sheep. And got one more here. Another sheep. And what's he holding? A bird on his head. That's cool. Maybe it landed there. That's right. What can you guys tell me about the shepherds? Eliza? They saw angels, yes. The angels told them something. What did the angels tell them? Everett? That Jesus was born. This long-awaited Messiah was born. What did the shepherds do when they heard the angels? When they saw the angels? Eliza? They did. But what happened first? What was their first reaction? Everett. They were scared. So scared. It's the middle of the night. These shepherds are very tired. Because unlike shepherds that we might see today, who live on a farm and have shepherds out in a field that's nicely fenced, these shepherds were living with their sheep for many days at a time. They would follow their sheep through all the open land in the area, letting them graze where they could, right? They lived with their sheep, basically. How do you think they smelled? Did they smell like perfume? Flowers? Maybe vanilla. Did they smell like vanilla? They smelled bad. They smelled like sheep who had been out in the rain and the weather for many, many days. These guys hadn't showered for several days, okay? They probably washed their face and their hands when they needed to, but they'd been sleeping next to the sheep, sleeping on the ground. They were kind of smelly. They weren't, like, prepared to go and present themselves to before the throne of a king, were they? But when the the shepherds were visited by the angels, and the angels said, you need to go, the Messiah has been born. You will find him in a a manger, a stable. A stable? A barn? Well, they would fit right in there, wouldn't they? The stable would have been just as smelly as they were. Nobody would have noticed that they smelled at all. So they were probably like, oh, okay, we can go to the stable and see the Messiah. 
But they were excited, weren't they? Once they got over their fright from the angels, they were excited. They're like, we got to go right now. This is something that our people, the Israelites, have been waiting for for hundreds of years. We've got to go. We were chosen to be one of the first ones to see the Messiah, us, lowly shepherds out in the field. So they left their sheep, right? They probably left somebody behind to look after the sheep. But they all got up. They took the very best sheep that they had, right, as an as a offering to them, and they went and searched for that baby in the manger. Yeah. What kinds of clothes do you think they were wearing? Eliza? Bonnets, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, stuff that ropes around their waist. You guys did a, a program at school recently, didn't you? And you had to dress up like characters from the Bible. You had these big flowy things on and you tied stuff around your waist, right? Some of you had things on your head. They were costumes to look like Bible people. That's right. Some of you looked like shepherds. Some of you were a little bit more dressed up, right? Some of you were kings. Like Everett was a king. He got to wear special clothes. Two kings. All right. That's right. How appropriate. It might not have because, again, they were out in the elements for quite a few days at this time. They hadn't had a chance to do their laundry, right? They hadn't gotten to iron their clothes and make it look just so and nice. Their clothes probably smelled too, huh? Kind of dirty. They'd been sleeping on the ground. But their clothes would have been very simple because these guys didn't have a whole lot of money. They were watching over sheep for a living, right? So their clothes would have been made out of very simple materials like, oh, say this here. It's a very serviceable material, a nice black. It holds all the dirt, right? It hides it. You don't see as much of the dirt with something like this, and it, it'll last a long time. It's a good stiff material, right? And uh, something like this here. This is a linen. Okay, so they would have wrapped this around their heads to keep them nice and cool or warm, depending on the weather. Linen doesn't hold in the, the moisture, so they would have been comfortable with this on their heads. Would have shielded them from the sun during the day and protected them from the cold wind at night. But also, it's not colorful, is it? It's very simple. Yeah, shepherds didn't have a lot of money for, like, dyes and stuff to make their clothes look really pretty. And who was going to see them anyway? The sheep. Do you think the sheep cared whether or not their clothes were pretty? No. All right. And here we've got something that looks really soft. What do you think shepherds, what material would they have worn a lot of? Something that was readily available to them. Everett? Wool. Wool comes from? Sheep. They had lots of access to, sh to sheep's wool, right? They sheared the sheep. That's right. Oh, you just right-click on the sheep and it shears it. I think they would have loved that back then because I think it was kind of a messy job back then. But this feels nice and soft like wool, okay? And so we're going to have them line the manger with this woolly fabric so it's nice and soft for baby Jesus and this linen because this is what they would have worn and like this black because it wouldn't show the dirt and the smelliness, right? So guys, come on up here and grab some strips of cloth and start lining this manger for baby Jesus. We want these shepherds to have a part in the story of Jesus. There's plenty here. Everybody take a couple, maybe. That's a good one. Can you put it up? Yeah, we got some more here, guys. There. Thank you. We got to make Jesus comfortable in his manger bed. The shepherds were ordinary working class people. Kind of smelly, huh? But the angels came to them because God wanted to include them in the story of Jesus' birth. Yeah. All right, y'all are dismissed. Thank you.
this story is really special to me because I can really appreciate that Jesus includes people that come from a smelly barn in his story. I also want to highlight that uh, Virgin has a book in the library that tells a new book uh, that tells the perspective of the Christmas story from the shepherds. So even if you're not a child, maybe you want to check that out. Let's read the scripture for this morning is Ezra 3, 10 through 13. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments with trumpets and the Levites, the son of Aspha with cymbals, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, he is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept, wept out loud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. Would you like to pray together? <laughs> Lord, I want to ask that you bless the words that Priscilla has prepared this morning and bless our ears as they hear them. Um, that we may see your light in all that is said this morning. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning, and welcome to this, the third Sunday of Advent. Um, the title this morning is Rebuilding the Temple with the subtitle of First Things First. Uh, so this morning we're going to begin in Ezra 3, 10 through 13, as Michelle just read go further back in time, and then go forward to Luke 2, 25 to 32. In 539 BC, Persia conquered Babylon, and King Cyrus freed the Jews and allowed them to return to their homeland. He also encouraged them to build their temple, or rebuild their temple. He gives them silver, gold, and some of the relics from the Solomon's temple that had been stolen when they were conquered and sent into exile. Now, because a whole generation had grown up in Babylon, some of them decided to stay, and only about 42,000 or so returned to their homeland. It took the Jews a few years to get settled and begin to rebuild the temple, the second temple. In 536 BC, they finally laid the foundation where their first temple, Solomon's temple, had been. Solomon's temple had been built on Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah was also where Abraham had taken Isaac to be sacrificed. After laying the foundation, the older generation wept aloud because they had seen Solomon's temple. They remembered how beautiful and ornate it was, while the younger generation shouted for joy because the foundation was finally laid. Their combined shouting and weeping was so loud the noise was heard far away. To get an idea of why the older generation may have been weeping, let's compare what David and Solomon had done to what the Jews had done. David had collected and given Solomon 4,000 tons of gold, 40,000 tons of silver. The original temple had the Ark of the Covenant and it also had the tabernacle. These last two elements were tied to God's presence. Silas, when he freed the Jews, had given them half a ton of gold, only three tons of silver. They didn't have the Ark of the Covenant, and they didn't have the tabernacle. There are times in our lives where we have to rebuild or change. Set the reset button. It's during these times we need to ask ourselves, what is my foundation? What am I building on? What are my priorities? Are we consumed with what we have and how things look? 
that we forget about the most important things? What are we putting first in our lives? So now that the foundation is laid, the Jews can begin rebuilding, or can they? Remember, they had been gone for 50 years, and the non-Jews were used to having land all to themselves, and they hated the Jews. They didn't want them to build their temple, and, were, and, to get, and they were able to get the building stopped. For 20 years, nothing happened. The foundation just laid there. Now, King Darius comes to power, and he allows the Jews to continue and complete building their temple. He gives them some tax money to help. This second temple was completed in 515 BC. This modest temple stood until 156 BC when the Greeks defiled the temple. They erected an altar to Zeus and offered burnt offerings and sacrificed pigs. The Greeks wanted to eliminate Judaism, but didn't destroy or burn the temple. Instead, they turned it into an idol house of worship. Do we sometimes do the same? Are we guilty of that? Is God replaced with other things in our lives? Where's our focus? What is important to us? Do we allow things of this world to become more important than God? In 20 BC, Herod decides to restore the temple. Not only does he restore it, he expands it. Jesus is born, and on the 40th day, Joseph and Mary bring him to the temple to be dedicated and to make a sacrifice, as was their custom. At the temple is an older man named Simon, Simeon. He's a learned man, not a priest, but very, very devout. In fact, he had been living so devoutly that the Holy Spirit promised him that before he died, he would see the Messiah or the Christ child. On this day, 40 days after Jesus is born, the Holy Spirit told Simeon to go to the temple. He obeys, and that promise is fulfilled. The Bible says that he recognized Jesus and took him in his arms. Could you imagine holding the Christ child, the Son of God? It's no wonder, he said, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Something I found interesting was that Joseph and Mary didn't have to introduce Jesus to Simeon, yet he knew who he was. Are we like Simeon? Do we recognize that God is with us, always? Would we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit? This simple temple, the second temple, built on Solomon's temple's location, lasted 400 years, lasted 400 years longer than Solomon's. It was restored and expanded by Herod. It was the temple Jesus, the Christ child, the Son of God, was dedicated. Sometimes we forget the simple things last the longest and mean the most. Some other notes that I had written down, it was Herod's temple was destroyed in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman army. One of the parts still standing today is the walls, the most important one being the Western Wall, also known as the Wailing Wall. This wall is believed to be where the Holy of Holies was located in Solomon's time. The second thing was there were 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 generations from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 generations from the exile to the Messiah. Three temples were located on the eastern edge of Jerusalem, just west of Gethsemane and northwest of the Kidron Valley. In closing, the song I've asked to be played is titled First Things First. It's by Consumed by Fire. I heard this for the first time a couple of months ago, and this song has been um, a prayer for my life. As you watch the video and listen to the words, think about the question that Glenn asked us last Sunday. How are you preparing the way for Jesus coming as a babe, 
as Jesus as his second coming? How are you preparing your heart, your mind, and your soul?